What happened in Episode 7 of House of the Dragon, Driftmark, and how will it impact on the rest of the season? Let's break it down in nerdy detail. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover A Song of Ice and Fire, The Lord of the Rings, and much more. If you love in-depth discussion of great fantasy and science fiction, then please consider clicking the subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. Episode 7 of House of the Dragon picks up in the wake of Episode 6. There's no time jump this time. So everything is raw. Lena's death, Harwin and Lionel Strong's deaths, the growing frictions between Alicent and Rhaenyra. And so, wonderfully, we now have the equivalent of a bottle episode. For almost the entire episode, everyone is stuck in the same place, the island of Driftmark. Everyone being together like this will not happen again during the show. The divisions will be too great. It's Lena's funeral, and being Valarion rather than Targaryen, this is a sea-based ceremony. The stone coffin drops to the bottom of the sea, and Vaymond Valarion intones words to the Merling King. The Merling King is the god of the Narrow Sea, who the Valarions claim they struck a deal with centuries earlier. The Velaryons are proud of their heritage, but it's certainly a bit jarring for Lena, daughter of a Targaryen, the rider of Vagar, who chose death by fire, to be buried this way. The Targaryens and Velaryons now are effectively one house. After the ceremony, everyone is milling awkwardly around that veranda area, and to be honest, the first half hour of the episode is a whole series of wonderfully awkward interactions, each worthy of note on their own, and the theme of whether to conform to duty or be true to oneself comes up repeatedly. We should probably give a nod first to Renis, though, who is pretty much the only person to both grieve properly herself and seemingly care enough to care for others in their grief. The queen who never was would clearly have been a caring queen. She shows a lot of emotional maturity overall here, including talking to her husband Corlys about his ambitions. She has accepted that she won't be queen, and yet Corlys is still driven by ambition for his family. The pursuit of legacy. You get the feeling that Corlys may go on a journey with this, so keep an eye on it for the next couple of seasons. Lainor is also pretty affected, wading into the sea and crying over his dead sister. Corlys is clearly embarrassed by this and gets Carl Corry, Lainor's new lover, to bring him back. We'll come back to Lainor in a bit, because this is a big episode for him. One of the undercurrents here is the fact that, although everyone here is mourning Lena, some are also secretly mourning Harwin, Rhaenyra's lover and father of Jace and Lucerys. Jace at least understands that that was his real father who died in that fire. Rhaenyra makes sure he does his duty, though, and offers his condolences to Lena's children. This is a hard situation for everyone. Viserys tries to mend some fences with Daemon, but Daemon is clearly still hurting. Their relationship has been so much stronger on the show than in the book, so perhaps they will get a final chance to reconcile. I hope so. But probably the most important moment with Viserys happens after that, although it is ignored by almost everyone present. As he passes by Alicent, his second wife, he says, I'm going to bed now, Emma. Emma is, of course, the name of his first wife. At the risk of over-interpreting this, it recalls what we are told happened with Jaehaerys, Viserys' father and Alicent, who was then his helper. Jaehaerys repeatedly confused Alicent with someone else. Sarah, his estranged daughter. I wonder whether Viserys will echo this in a more significant way before he dies. Helena, Alicent and Viserys' daughter, meanwhile, is still muttering prophecy, and no one is paying any attention. Remember last time when she said that Aemond would get a dragon, but he would need to close one eye? That's what happened this episode, and now she is saying, Hand turns loom, spool of green, spool of black, dragons of flesh weaving dragons of thread, and then snapping her hands shut on the spider she had been playing with, the Greens and the Blacks at war. I hope we get more of this. Helena as a dragon dreamer that no one listens to is a great addition to the canon. 
But let's move on to the two massive plot developments in this episode. First, Rhaenyra and Daemon. Rhaenyra moves through the wake apparently alone in all this. Her lover is dead and she can't even mourn him publicly. Her husband is doing his own thing. Otto Hightower is back. Alicent still clearly hates her, but Damon is here. She hasn't seen him for that whole ten years of the time jump and there's a lot to catch up on. There has always been that slightly weird connection between these two, and they have a long overdue heart-to-heart walking down the beach. In the official Inside the Episode video, Emma Darcy, who plays Rhaenyra, talks about her, Rhaenyra's, sense of abandonment. Her mother died, her lover Harwin died, her friendship with Alicent was long gone, and Damon, in her eyes, had abandoned her at a young age. He responds by saying that he spared her because she was just a child at the time, but this is a bit wrong because even after he left her there in Flea Bottom, he still tried to get Viserys to agree to their marriage afterwards, so Damon isn't being entirely honest. But she says she is no longer a child and she wants him now. Their union is thus a tribute to both their undeniable connection and political reality. I talked about how Rhaenyra must have felt very alone during that wake. Now she has an ally and a powerful one. I don't think this was just cold real politique from Rhaenyra, but it was certainly a part of it. The only problem, of course, is that she is still married, and Lenor has suddenly got all serious on her. His sister's death has made him reassess things, and he wants to go back to what they agreed all that time ago. He will be the dutiful husband in public, all she ever wanted him to be. He even wishes he were different, that he wasn't gay. To her credit, she is having none of it. There's a solution here that will give everyone what they actually want. The lies can stop. She doesn't have to pretend to be in a happy marriage. He doesn't have to pretend to be straight. They fake Lenor's death, and he escapes to Essos with his lover Carl and a pouch full of gold, and Rhaenyra is free to marry Damon. This is different to what is hinted at in the book. In book canon, I will admit that I still suspect Damon of a lot. His wife, Rhaenyra's lover and husband all die in quick succession, and there is no mysterious burned body hiding the evidence. The person who benefits is Damon. But here, everyone wins, and it's hard not to feel happy about that. Although, Lenor being alive does definitely open up another set of questions, because in the books, his dragon is later claimed by someone else. So, will that be the first and only time we read about that a dragon rider has abandoned their dragon, and the dragon has taken a new rider? I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens next season. In both versions of events, Rhaenyra and Daemon getting together is scandalously quick on the heels of their spouses' deaths. Their marriage ceremony back on Dragonstone is Valyrian. They are blood-bonded as their children look on. One of the many great things about this season is how we have seen so much more of Valyrian culture, and here we have two of the most Valyrian Valyrians coming together in an unbreakable alliance. And as an aside here, After episode 3, there was some speculation in online Game of Thrones communities that Daemon might have caught Greyscale from the crab feeder when he fought him. We saw a lot of Daemon's body this episode, albeit in the dark, so let me know in the comments if you think you can see any evidence of it. Moving to the other main plot development, we have Aemond claiming Vhagar, the dragon. If you remember, he's the only one of his immediate family to still not have a dragon, and he's been bullied for it. And now there's a dragon here without a rider. He takes the chance. This is the first time we've seen anyone claim a dragon like this and bond with it. But this isn't just any dragon. This is Vagar, the oldest, biggest, fiercest dragon alive. One of the things George R. R. Martin was clear about that he wanted to happen in this show was for the dragons to be different to each other, not just in terms of size and colour, but also personality. And Vagar is one of a kind. Many of the dragons we will see in this show are young, inexperienced, pliable. Vagar is not. Vagar is a game changer. Whoever rides Vagar is instantly one of the most powerful and to be feared people in all Westeros. 
and now Amund has Vega. But was he breaking some kind of rule by claiming her? Baylor, Rayner, Jace, and Luceris certainly seem to think so. They say it was stealing, and that Vagar was theirs to claim. Vagar had been Lena's dragon, and this was Lena's funeral, so at the very least this was dispassionate and a slap in the face. And, well, it's hard to see Aemond as being in the right here, but he took the opportunity, and it's clear that that introverted, slightly awkward kid, bullied by his brother, is gone. He now rides Vega, and he is to be feared. He clearly thinks that losing an eye is a fair trade. The confrontation that follows the fight between the cousins is the heartbeat of the episode, because it is when the simmering tensions that have been there throughout the series turn into outright threats of violence, and the family who had, with varying degrees of success, tried to bury enmities and come together to honour the recently departed just fell apart again. Alicent's love for her children is clearly her kryptonite. She's spent years staying just the right side of polite necessity, but now her son has had his eye cut out, and there is no stopping her. She will get her vengeance. We should probably add into the mix here Rhaenyra stirring the pot a bit, newly invigorated by her night with Daemon and the strength of the alliance that that brings. Viserys' strength and weaknesses are also on full show here. He is loyal to Rhaenyra and pushes his grandchildren to be truthful about what happened and why. Remember how he pushed Otto and Lionel Strong to be clear about what exactly they were accusing Rhaenyra of. It's clearly something that is important to him. But even with the truth out there, everyone knows now that Rhaenyra's children aren't Lainor's. He doesn't budge. He just wants peace. Yes, this is his natural character. He is the conflict avoider extraordinaire, but there is the added level of him believing that the future of the entire human race depends on his keeping the Targaryen family united. Viserys opts to keep the status quo. Anyone who dares to suggest that Rhaenyra's children are bastards will lose their tongue. And so there are no real punishments here. Aemond has Vega but loses an eye. Rhaenyra loses her husband and her lover and gains Daemon. Alicent on the boat home chooses not to use Laris to get her revenge. His time will come. Seriously, Laris is emerging as the most disconcerting character in the show. I think we all know what would have happened if Alicent had given him the nod to go ahead and get her revenge. As a quick aside, I said last time that Laris's new sigil was a bee, mea culpa. It turns out that it is actually a firefly. I think the imagery, however, is still the same. Fireflies are pollinators too, but they are more associated with fire, like House Hightower, who light the way. So where are we in the wake of this? The two teams of green and black are now formed. Alicent has the weight of the Westerosi establishment on her side. Her father is Hand of the King. Aemond has just won the mightiest dragon of them all. She has the ear of the king and the king's firstborn son. But Rhaenyra is still the named heir. Daemon has joined her side, as well as the Velaryons. They have more dragons and a burning sense of injustice behind them. Who has the upper hand at this point? Well, to be honest, neither of them. And that's what's driving the action forward. But what did I miss in this episode? Let me know in the comments below. If you'd like to see more of Song of Ice and Fire videos, please click on the link appearing now on the left of your screen. Or to support this channel and get access to exclusive In Deep Geek content, please click on the link to Patreon on the right of your screen. That's all for this time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.